Thank you. It's really nice to be back at Waterloo. It's been a number of years since I was here. So I'm going to talk about some of my favorite problems in computational geometry at the interface with optimization. Some of the work is work in progress. I have the uh, you know, citations to some of the funding agencies here, and I'll have citations to some of my co-authors along the way, which include Anna, by the way. So. Here's a laundry list of some of the problems of interest and some of the um, motivating applications that motivate much of the optimization work that I do. Uh, for a long time, since my thesis, I've worked in geometric routing problems, finding optimal paths and optimal networks in geometric settings. Uh, and we'll talk about a number of those here. They are motivated by robotics. That was the original field that, I, that introduced me to computational geometry. I had to do some uh, robotic motion planning algorithms, and I got a feel for it through computational geometry. But lately, I've been working a lot with sensor network applications, vehicle routing, logistics, et cetera. Um, and some of my current uh, emphases of, uh, yeah, of, of interest are the role of uncertainty and robustness in computing solutions to optimization problems. So here is one problem that we just started working on. Uh, we call it the horsefly problem. And it has to do with uh, delivering, uh, delivering products, perhaps by a fleet of trucks and drones. So the, think of the truck as like an aircraft carrier that's moving around. Amazon's going to deliver packages to your to your place. And if the truck had to go to your sites, to the individual locations, then this is just the classic TSP, vehicle routing problem, for a single vehicle in this case. If the truck stays put and the aerial drones are very, very fast, then you're just going to have the drone fly uh, in any order to the uh, customer locations to deliver the packages. But if you combine them, then the truck is going to go on some route that we hope to compute, and the drones will fly off from that route and come back. This is one where there's a single uh, drone. This is one where there's three. And these were actually computed by one of John Gunnar Carlson's students uh, who's working with us on this project. So this is a, a problem of current interest. So some background. Suppose I give you endpoints in a geometric domain, let's say the Euclidean plane, uh, and you want to cover these points with a tour. So a tour will be a cycle uh, that visits all the points. Well, that's the classic geometric TSP problem. In fact, my advisor, Pop Dimitriou, is the one who proved that this two-dimensional Euclidean TSP problem is NP-hard. And uh, we've worked on approximation methods for this. You may know that there's a uh, polynomial time approximation in geometric domains. In fact, even in, in, in fairly general geometric domains, uh, in any fixed dimension or low doubling dimension, so on, uh, this problem has a 1 plus epsilon approximation. So it's very well understood for a set of points. What about a set of regions? So cover a set of disks. I give you a set of n points that are the centers of, say, in this case, unit disks. And perhaps I need to get to a point within each of these disks in order to be able to read data from a sensor. So this is what we call TSP with neighborhoods. And it requires you to find a shortest path that visits all of the neighborhoods in some order. So this is TSP with circular neighborhoods. Uh, you might want to cover them with a set of routes. This is a vehicle routing problem. You may or may not have depots from which the vehicles depart. Uh, to visit the customers. Uh, we sometimes call it the school bus route problem. That's how it was formulated in the original work by Arkin and Hassin. Uh, each child is willing to go the radius of one of these disks to meet the school bus, and you're trying to find the routes for the school bus to visit or pick up all of the children. Um, more generally, you might have other tasks that your vehicle needs to do on its tour. So one of the problems that Anna and I have both worked on is the so-called watchman route problem. I give you a geometric domain. In this case, it's a polygon that has two holes in it. So it has genus two. And I want to uh, find a route for a robot that has a camera to see every point or search the, the geometric domain. How would I do that? Well, I have to visit this green region because I have to see that point. 
I have to visit this green region because I have to see that point. In fact, I have to visit lots of such green regions, the visibility polygons associated with every point in the polygon. If, if my goal is to do a complete visibility sweep of the polygon, then I'm looking for what we call a watchman route, a shortest route, like perhaps this route in red, that allows you to see every point. And this might be how you search for uh, a lost child or an unknown intruder, et cetera. So this is the classic watchman route problem. It's been around in our field since 1986, actually. And there's many variations of this problem of considerable interest to us. One is generalizing it to multiple agents. We know actually very little, theoretically, about the watchman route, even for two vehicles within a simple polygon. Uh, I mean, we know some hardness and so on, but we don't have good solutions, and there's several open questions. Another problem that we're currently working on is what we call the tethered TSP problem, where we have two or more vehicles, and, they, and there's a constraint that they be within a certain distance of each other for communication purposes or for support purposes if they're doing a coordinated action. So we call this the tethered TSP and uh, we, we're currently working on that problem and have a few things to say there. Uh, you may or may not have depots. It may be an offline or an online problem. By, you may discover the, the geometry and the locations that you need to visit in an online setting, in which case we're looking for competitive analysis. Uh, we've been looking, and I'll mention some, some work on time windows, where there's a certain window of time when you need to visit a site. If you're delivering Amazon packages, there's a window in which you're expected to deliver the package. Uh, the sites might be in motion. Uh, there are variants in which you're trying to monitor trajectories uh, with, with such explorers. And a lot of our work recently has been on the case of stochastic models with uncertain sites. We're not sure which sites we need to visit. We're not sure exactly where they are. So I'll talk a little bit about that. There may be precedence constraints that you have to visit one site to pick up something before you go to another site. Um, there's classic uh, variants of, of TSP and vehicle routing in which there's prizes, prize collecting TSP, et cetera. And in general, there's lots of objectives. It's really a multi-criteria optimization problem. There's many different objective functions, whether there's one or more objective. Uh, sometimes we look at minimum latency, the time, uh, the, the, latent, the total latency time to get the, to visit each of the sites that you're trying to visit. We look at link distance problems or minimizing the number of turns. Of course, there's the standard Euclidean and other metric kinds of uh, uh, costs associated with these. Uh, we sometimes look at bottleneck versions where we minimize the maximum length of an edge or maximize the minimum length of an edge. We've worked on that problem as well. That's called the maximum scatter TSP. Um, and these stochastic metrics where we may be interested in controlling the probability that the tour is too long or its expected, its expected length, et cetera. And then, of course, all of these metrics can be combined. So some of the applications motivating us come from uh, data gathering uh, in, in sensor networks. So suppose you have a set of sensors, these points. What does it mean to gather data? Well, if you actually physically have to arrive at the point, then it's a version of TSP. If you have to get close to it, it's a version of TSP with neighborhoods. If you have to be able to see it, then it's the watchman route. And it may be watchman route with limited sight distance if you not only need to see it, but you need to be within a certain <coughs> distance of it. So one model of the data gathering problem that we've recently looked at with uh, some of our students and my colleague Gia Gao at, at Stony Brook uh, is the data gathering problem in the following model. We have sensors deployed in some domain. Each of them has a certain amount of memory and it's gathering data at a certain rate. Suppose we know their locations, we know their capacities, and we know the data rates, and we have a data mule that's going to go collect data from these sensors. It may have to get to the sensor or get close to the sensor. So given a set of mules uh, and a speed associated with the, the mules, you need to visit the sensors uh, you know about their capacities, you know the rate at which they're gathering data, so you can predict when uh, a, a sensor is going to start going into overflow and it's going to be losing data. So our objective is to come up with a schedule, uh, so time is important, and 
the, the, the embedding of the path, the, the tour itself. So we're finding a trajectory to maximize the data collection rate, the net data collection rate for the set of sensors. Um, and in, in the case of uh, the no data loss problem, we're demanding that you lose no data. So I'm not going to let you, you uh, let any of them overflow. And my objective is to minimize the number of mules. How many mules do I need in order to accomplish the task? So we've looked at both of these optimization problems. Um, and here's a table of some recent results on it. So there, essentially, all of these problems are hard, although there's some very simple problems that we can solve exactly, uh, in which case, what you see in the table are the approximation factors that we're able to achieve. Um, so for instance, in the no data loss uh, category, uh, in a very simple setting where you have just the sensors are all on a line or on a road, that you can do exactly, but more generally we can get a constant factor approximation. Okay. Um, so related variant of TSP that arises in this problem, and we've also studied, is the so-called orienteering problem. In the orienteering problem, instead of saying, find the shortest tour to visit a set of sites, it's saying you have a certain length L, find a tour that visits as many sites as possible within uh, the, the quota, the length L. So it's also sometimes known as the bank robber problem. These are banks, they have a certain amount of money, you're trying to rob as much money as possible, uh, and you have a certain amount of gas in the tank of your getaway car. So you're trying to uh, find a subset of sites to visit as well as the tour to visit them or the path to visit them. And for this, we gave a constant factor approximation, which was later improved uh, using this M-guillotine method uh, that I developed for a PTAS for the TSP that gives, in fact, a PTAS for this as well. That means you can get within 1 plus epsilon times opt in polynomial time for this problem. In the data gathering setting, uh, we're actually trying to maximize the collected data rate. So that's why it's a related problem. It's not exactly the same problem. The open question here is whether the uh, running time can be improved. For the TSP problem, we can now give a PTAS that, that runs in n log n time. Uh, worst case n log n time in geometric domains, but this particular, the, the orienteering problem, we don't know. So that's an open problem. Uh, other variants of the TSP that are relevant here, I mentioned already prize collecting TSP, where you may get prizes for uh, sites that you visit, or you may have penalties for sites that you don't visit. Uh, and related to that is the profitable tour problem where you're maximizing the difference between the prizes and the costs. And then there's TSP with time windows where time matters. And in many of these delivery type problems, time is crucial. So the TSP or orienteering with time windows, you're given a set of sites, each with a time window, a release time and a due date, a due time. Uh, and you're given a bounded length L uh, how, how much time or how much distance you can travel, and uh, you're trying to find a path or a tour that maximizes the number of sites that you successfully visit during their uh, given time windows. So you only get credit for it if you visit during the time window. Um, so we've looked at two variants of these time window TSP problems in a recent uh, paper in Wafer. Uh, time window prize collecting, uh, you have a unit speed robot, must visit every site during its given time window, and you maximize the number of sites visited. That's exactly the problem I mentioned before. The time window traveling salesman problem is one where the goal is to minimize the distance the robot travels in order to visit all sites in, in the time window. Of course, it may not be feasible to do that, and in these problems we often look at dual approximations where we also relax the constraints. So just to give a flavor for what some of these look like, so here is one result if you're in 1D, so the points are along a line, and each has a time window. It's in fact a 2D problem, because you can view this in space time. And so corresponding to each position along the x-axis, there's a window of time in which you must visit it, and you're looking for a route for a bounded speed robot to visit some number of these sites, so the slope of this uh, red 
trajectory is bounded. That's, that's determined by the speed. And your goal is to visit as many as possible. Um, so we relax the time window by a small epsilon times uh, this uh, laxity. Uh, so you, you, might, you might meet a site slightly outside of its required time window. So that's the sense in which it's a dual approximation. Uh, but we are visiting at least as many sites as opt. So this is one, uh, one, one kind of approximation in, in this much running time. And we have a variety of, of similar results in 2D and in metric spaces, et cetera, that yield approximate optimal solutions to these problems. And here I dug up a paper that actually shows uh, the, uh, the practical aspects of this. This is their image, not mine. Uh, the orienteering problem with time windows applied to robotic melon harvesting. So some Israeli colleagues looked at this problem. You need to be able to pick the melons at the appropriate times. Maximize the number. Back to the data gathering by data mule uh, problem. Uh, we look at, the, at it as an orienteering path. First of all, if you find an orienteering path that covers the maximum number of sensors within the capacity over two time, this will yield a one-third approximation to the general case. And I give a little argument down here, but I, I think I'm not going to take the time to go through it. But th this is the connection between the data gathering problem and the orienteering problem. And we use the results to connect it in that way. Uh, and in particular, because the orienteering problem in Euclidean spaces has a PTAS, 1 plus epsilon approximation, more generally it has a constant factor 2 plus epsilon then it gives us these approximations that appeared in our chart. Uh, and then we're able to generalize that to the case of multiple mules, where again, your tr re reminder here that the goal is to uh, visit as many of these sensors as possible uh, subject to the constraints. Maximize the, to well, vi visit them and collect the most data for a given number of, of mules. Uncertainty. So I'm going to look at some problems of TSP with uncertain data. And here I'm just mentioning the, some of the sources of uncertainty. Of course, there's measurement errors. Uh, a lot of the data uh, comes from naturally stochastic sources, such as weather data. I've worked a lot in, in this area in, in other routing applications. Uh, incomplete information. You may have an unknown map. And there may be deliberate uncertainty that comes from scrambling for privacy considerations. In the context of weather data and routing, I've worked for quite a while on routing problems for aircraft uh, in projects with NASA and the FAA, uh, routing aircraft in the presence of uncertain obstacles that are imposed by weather, uh, weather predictions, whether it's turbulence, icing, volcanic ash, uh, uh, convective weather, et cetera. So, uh, we often get weather data, which gives us stochastic description of what the environment is like, and we have to plan in the face of that uncertainty. Yeah? Um, some of those are objects are moving there. Absolutely. It's dynamic. Uh, it, it, so, yeah. So what we typically have in, the, in this setting is we get from the National Weather Service, um, well, we have historical data, and we, in, in essence, train on the historical data. And then in terms of the predictions, we have the five minute, 10 minute, 30 minute, one hour, three hour forecasts. And those have increasing levels of uncertainty. So we treat them differently in our planning. But we are planning where the storm's going to be three hours from now when the flight's going to reach Chicago, for instance. So we have to take into account dynamic, uncertain weather data. So this was a big part of that project. In the context of the traveling salesman problem, well, one way to, to talk about locational uncertainty is just give me a region, a support set for the probability distribution. I'm not sure where this site is. It lies somewhere in this polygon. Maybe this one I know pretty much where it lies, et cetera. So you could consider these regions to be the support sets or the regions of uncertainty for the data. The TSP with neighborhoods is actually taking an opportunistic outlook here and saying, what's the best you could possibly do? So if, if you're lucky enough that that's the point, 
that you need to visit, then this is in, in essence giving you a lower bound on opt. You can't do better than the TSP with neighborhoods. So that's why it's relevant. Um, now that we've worked considerably on this TSP with neighborhoods problem, the hope when I, actually when I stumbled upon the PTAS for TSP on points, I was trying to solve this problem. And uh, then my hope was, oh, okay, so we can do really well for TSP on points. We should be able to use those techniques for TSP with neighborhoods, but it's a little bit more difficult than that. In the TSP approximations that both Sanjeev Arora and I have given, at, at some level they're looking at a dynamic program where you're putting together sub-problems. And the, the issue is if you window the data, if these green things are the regions of your TSP with neighborhoods that you need to visit, inside of a sub-problem uh, you have uncertain sites. Now uncertain sites whose support sets lie completely inside, well, those you need to assign to that subproblem. So that's known. The difficulty is that the regions that cross the boundary, you don't know whether it's the responsibility of the subproblem to visit that region or it was already visited on the outside. So we quickly discovered that the TSP methods that we had developed for points were not applying to regions. In the case of points, a point is either inside or outside. In the case of regions, they straddled the boundary. So the status is a bit more up in the air with TSP with neighborhoods. There's been a lot of progress. We do have PTASs if you have fatness of the regions and they're disjoint or nearly so. There's bounded overlap. Um, and we can do that even in doubling metrics, uh, a generalization of, of bounded dimension Euclidean spaces. Um, and we have constant factor approximations for many of these cases. Uh, most recently, I think, well, so I know I can do overlapping convex regions in the plane. I hope perhaps also fat regions. Uh, for general regions, uh, the first paper I wrote on this gave a log factor approximation. That continues to be the best, and I keep getting stuck. So what I think I have now is a proof that you cannot do better than a con that there is no constant factor approximation, and in fact, uh, I, I'm hopeful that the hardness of approximation shows that the log is tight. Uh, details to be forthcoming. What about models of uncertainty? Well, so for TSP, one model that's been looked at classically 30 years ago is the existentially uncertain points. So each point, you're not sure if it's, you're not sure if you need to visit that person today or not. But what you want to do is you want to uh, find a tour okay, uh, that of, of all the sites so that later when it's announced what subset you actually have to visit, which is according to a probability distribution which is assumed to be so-called node invariant. All it depends on is the cardinality of the subset. Then you will shortcut your tour. So, you, so you're to compute a tour of all the sites, but then you will visit the subset you must visit the, the, the random subset according to that order. So this is a more formal statement. You're looking for a master tour on all the sites to minimize, for instance, the expected length of the tour under a random choice of uh, subsets uh, that you must visit. Uh, here's an example from Gillet's 1988 uh, thesis just showing the effect of two different master tours on the same set of points. Here's one, here's another. If your actual set of sites you must visit are the red dots, then you get two different tours and maybe one is better than the other. The question is how do you come up with a master tour that takes into account the uncertainty of you're not sure which, uh, which customers you'll actually have to visit. So one of the first questions you might ask is, uh, well, might it be optimal or nearly optimal to just take the TSP on all the sites? So here's an example where if you take the TSP on all the sites, uh, you're not going to do as well. In this case, it's only a factor of 1.3 times opt. Better would be to do this zigzag master tour if, in fact, you're flipping coins, fair coins, and each point will be required to visit with probability a half. So this is an example from Chalet. And in fact, by modifying this example, you can show that this ratio gets arbitrarily bad if you make P very, very small. 
But what Gillet shows is that, in fact, the bound depends on p, inversely with p. So 1 plus 1 minus p over p. So if p is very small, this blows up. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to give uh, a, an approximation which doesn't have this bad dependence on p. OK. Um, so here's another example. Suppose this is your master set of points. The blue points are highly likely to be in your chosen set. So they are almost certainly there. And the red points are very unlikely. If you do a master tour that goes through all of them, that might be the unique TSP tour on all the data. But that's a bad choice, I claim. It will, in fact, be as bad as uh, a, a linear factor bad. So it, it could force you to, to zigzag. So what you expect to be realized here is that you only, most likely, you'll only have to visit the blue dots. So by, check, check, you know, by computing a master tour that went through everybody on a TSP, you end up being a factor n worse than if you had computed a tour on the blues, these highly likely points, and then somehow you need to insert the reds into it, but uh, we have ways to do that uh, to yield an approximation. So it can be that bad. So what's known more generally about the a priori TSP, this probabilistic TSP, there's a log factor approximation. There's an eight approximation in the so-called independent decision model. That's where you're flipping coins. Uh, there's a randomized four approximation, et cetera. But my question is, what can you do that exploits the geometry? Since I'm looking for geometric instances of network optimization problems where geometry gives us some uh, benefit. And for this, at least for a restricted subset of the problems, we're able to generalize the PTAS techniques to give, uh, to give a 1 plus epsilon solution. But it does have restrictions. And there are assumptions that go into this. And it's still open whether you can solve the general 2D problem with a PTAS. And it's also open whether you can uh, do one of these other models of random choice on the subset. What if instead of existential uncertainty, you're not sure if the site needs to be visited or not, you have locational uncertainty. You're not sure where the site is. You have to visit all the sites, but you're not sure where they are. So in essence, you have a set of points with distributions. Maybe you have estimates of what those distributions are. For instance, maybe it's just uniform over some regions, simple regions like disks. These are your noise regions. Think of them as the support sets. Um, so maybe it's just uniform there. Alternatively, maybe you have samples, so you have discrete data. And so each site is, in fact, just a discrete set of sample points. And you want to find in what order should you visit these sites. You're not sure where the point is going to be. The red dot is one particular outcome. But each of these discrete points has a probability associated with it. Minimize, for instance, the expected length of the tour. Um, that's one objective. We're also interested in minimizing variance, or possibly minimizing the max minus the min length of the tour. Um, minimize the longest possibility. That's what I'm going to talk about here in a moment that's mentioned in the abstract, the so-called adversarial TSP problem. Plan for the worst. So this is plan for the expected case. This is plan for the worst. Maybe you want to minimize a tail probability. You don't x, the length of your TSP tour, is a random variable. You don't want there to be a high probability that it's above L, because maybe that's how much fuel you have in your vehicle. Um, or minimize expectations subject to bounds on probabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a number of these objective functions that we've been investigating. Uh, for the simple one of minimize the expected length, you could just compute these expectations and then use linearity of expectation uh, and use a standard TSP approximation, like the Christophetus. Okay? But we're interested in exploiting geometric structure. Can we give a PTAS to minimize the expected tour length? And again, under some additional assumptions, we're able to do this. We're not able to do it yet in the general case. By additional assumptions, I mean something like if the support sets are pairwise disjoint fat regions, or nearly so, then we can do this kind of uh, PTAS. And the details are, are uh, formidable. Um, 
Another possibility is that you actually have a scenario-based model. This is similar to what we did with the weather data in, uh, in the air traffic management problems, where we use historical data. We look at the actual distribution of customers that UPS or Amazon was making its deliveries to, and we use that to estimate what we should do in terms of the tour. So maybe, you know, on the red day, you got the red points. On the blue day, you got the blue points, et cetera. So these are, these, this is a scenario-based model, and each of these has some probability distribution. Maybe it's uniform, maybe it's not. So you take your historical data, you create such a model, and now you want to, to plan a vehicle routing in the face of this kind of uncertainty. What can we do to exploit it? So if the red happens, then you're going to execute this. So you know, if you order the groups, that's your goal. Is to find a permutation of these groups of points to minimize the expected length of the tour. Okay? And uh, uh, one approach to all of these uh, TSP with locational uncertainty is just do TSP on the expected sites. You know, this is sort of like what we call a certainty equivalence principle. But it, we'll see that this does not work very well. So here's a simple example to try to get a handle on this. Suppose I give you 50-50 pairs. So each of these segments is actually a pair of points, and you're going to flip a coin, and with probability one half, one half, you'll pick either the left or the right instance. So the expected value of any one point is its midpoint. And suppose these red dots are on a grid. Uh, this isn't to scale. The distance is one between the rows. Distance is about one plus epsilon between the columns of red dots. Then, the, then an optimal, uh, the shortest tour on the expected points is going to look something like this blue that zigzags. Again, not to scale here. But its variance, if you calculate the variance of this, remember each of these pairs is going to be left or right with probability a half. The variance of this tour is, is, going to be, is going to grow linearly in n, theta of n. The expectation is linear in n with this particular uh, constant factor. Whereas if you had zigzagged the other way, and you could make it so that this is slightly longer than the previous one, so you're, it's suboptimal with respect to the length of the tour on the, uh, on the expected dots, the red dots, then the variance is only square root of n not n, uh, and the expectation is still about linear. So there are trade-offs between controlling the, the mean and controlling the variance, and that's some of the problems we're trying to address. In fact, you know, if you minimize the variance, how does it perform with the mean? If you minimize the mean, how does it perform with the variance? Again, a, a, a grid-like example um, where you have pairs of 50-50 points here I'm making them very, very close to each other. So epsilon distance between, but then capital M distance between these unit separated pairs. Then if you look at a tour that zigzags vertically, then you get a minimum variance tour. And the variance is only about square root of n. But if you, if you zigzag the other direction, the variance is high relatively, n, uh, but the, the length of the tour is significantly less, the expected length. So we're, we've looked at approximation algorithms for these scenario-based uh, models. And again, under some assumption, disjoint support sets that are fat at, or, or reasonably fat and reasonably disjoint, and they give a uh, PTAS. In, but we don't know about the general problem yet. What about the adversarial TSP? This is taking a very pessimistic view of it. So if I if I have these uncertain points, uh, I'm not sure where within these regions, these are the support sets, but I need to come up with a permutation. In what order should I visit these sites? And then the assumption is that I will go to the actual realization once it's announced. In the adversarial TSP, as we call it, you're going to assume the worst. You're going to assume an adversary is going to pick the worst possible point after you have announced what the permutation is. So I'm going to announce the order of visitation, and then you get to come along and pick what, uh, what point I have to visit in each region. Now recall that the TSP with neighborhoods was the opposite. 
you were going to, you get to pick the most opportunistic point of each region to visit. But the adversarial TSP is trying to control the tail of the distribution, the length of this uh, TSP tour. Um, so this is a more precise statement of the problem. Minimize the length of an adversarial tour for a given permutation pi. Um, you're to find that, uh, that, that ordering. It's trivially hard, just like TSP on points, because the regions could be singleton points. So the problem the adversary has to solve once you announce your permutation pi is actually a very simple problem that can be solved in polynomial time with dynamic programming. If I announce the order of a set of regions and you're trying to find a longest path to visit uh, those in that order, sort of the opposite of what we were doing with the shortest path through a sequence, that you can do in polynomial time. Um, even for general polygons, whereas in the shortest case it was hard for general polygons, it was polynomial for convex. Uh, that's what this work was. This is some work with, with Anna and Alone Frat. Um, so comparing these, the TSP with neighborhoods, you're, you're assuming the best possible point in each region, each site, uncertain site. In the stochastic TSP, you're, you're, you're minimizing the expected length of the tour. And in the adversarial TSP, you're assuming the worst and, and trying to pick the best ordering for an adversary. One thing to notice is that the length of an optimal solution to the adversarial TSP, it has to be at least as long as the opportunistic, the TSP with neighborhoods. That's a lower bound. And you'll never pay more than that length plus twice the diameter of each region added up. Because you just go to the opportunistic point, and then you go wherever you need to go, and then you come back to that point, et cetera. So this gives us a way to bound it, a simple way to bound it. And in essence, our approximation schemes, of course, rely on these, uh, these inequalities. <clears throat> so in our paper with a couple of my students in Sausage last year, we introduced the adversarial TSP problem. We give a simple three approximation that works in any metric space. Um, triangle inequality holds. And then we used geometry to give better results if you have disks or parallel segments or disjoint unit disks. And I'm not going to go through all of those results. I'll just mention the way the three approximation works is that we show that this uh, distance function where you take uh, the longest distance between a point of one region and a point of the other. So find the pair that's furthest apart from A to B. Call that dis the distance D. This is a metric. It satisfies the triangle inequality. That's a simple exercise to prove. And then once you have that, you can optimize in this max metric. Then the work is to prove this theorem that relates the two, that if you optimize in the max metric, you'll get an approximately optimal solution in the adversarial tour. And this is based on some simple standard techniques in combinatorial optimization, where we look at the relationship between a tour and a pair of matchings and relate it to the uh, lengths in the max metric. So uh, this, again, is not that difficult. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the argument. So that's in a metric space. You get a three approximation. It's an interesting open problem to see if you can do better than that factor three. We've worked on trying to bring that down. Does geometry help? Uh, that's, that's our question. And of course, I will claim that yeah, I saw this on Facebook or something. Without geometry, life is pointless. And I had to agree with that. So I look for geometric structure. So the first thing we realized is that our factor three approximation becomes better in the geometric setting just because of geometry. Uh, because of the nature of, say, circular disks, we're able to get this improved approximation factor. And it comes essentially from a packing argument. More generally, if you have unit disks that are disjoint in the plane, our main result and where most of the effort went is in showing that PTAS techniques can be developed to give a very good approximation, a 1 plus epsilon approximation, to the adversarial TSP. And for this, we had to modify the M guillotine method in order to account for the adversarial nature of these, uh, of these routes. So there's a lot of details. That that, of course, I'm skipping. 
one of the first things you can look at is the local optimality principle that you know that uh, the adversary is going to, to take you to extreme points on the boundaries of these regions. And so we're able to sort of snap to a, to a grid of points on the boundary of each polygon uh, or region and then uh, go through sort of a systematic method of, of approximation. Maybe I'll, I'll just mention what the recipe for these PTASs is. And this is true for many problems, not just the geometric TSP. You argue that you can take an optimal solution to whatever problem you're trying to solve, like the optimal TSP. You can modify it via a structural theorem. So this is the main thing you have to prove. That increasing the length of opt by a small factor, like 1 plus epsilon, you can get a new kind of structure or a network that has a particularly nice structure to it that's amenable to exact optimization. In our case, it's dynamic programming to solve uh, this special structure is, is what we call guillotine or m-guillotine. It's a recursive structure that allows dynamic programming to work. And then you have to prove a method that takes your optimal network from within this class of special structures and gets a solution to your original problem from it. So that's what we call solution recovery process. And we had to do each of these steps to get the result on the adversarial TSP, just as we've done these steps for many other geometric combinatorial optimization problems. This is an old slide of mine from the M guillotine structure. What, this black network is said to be three guillotine because you can always recursively partition with a cut, an axis parallel cut, so that the number of connected components in the intersection of the cut with the network is at most three, a constant. And that recursively happens down to the base. And the point is that if you give me any network, here's, I call it a scribble. So take, a scri take any, any network. It doesn't even have to be polygonal. It can be curved, whatever. The, the structure theorem says that you can convert this. this. This isn't, in general, going to be m guillotine. There may not be any nice cut that intersects it in only m connected components. But you can transform it to be m guillotine by adding some length to it. These red edges here, what I call bridges, by adding some selective edges, the red edges, whose total length by a charging scheme is at most epsilon times the length of the scribble. You don't have to add much to it. And it's already recursive. It has this m guillotine property, which allows dynamic programming to work. So any solution is epsilon close to being in this recursive class over which I can optimize. That's the general method of um, solving some of these problems. Now, the details can be formidable, so I'm going to skip those. But um, more generally, we can solve the adversarial TSP problem when the regions are uh, sort of separable by nice, nice shapes, sort of inside nearly uh, same size fat supersets. So there's still a lot of work to do. That was part of my student, Tyler Mayer's PhD thesis. He just graduated last week. Um, and so that's the adversarial TSP. I want to turn now to some problems of visibility. That appears in the title of the talk as well. So visibility optimization, optimizing what is seen and how to see it. So there's a classic problem that if you've been exposed to computational geometry, you've probably seen before. And it's the art gallery problem. And guarding an art gallery, what's an art gallery? It's this yellow region. It's, this is a polygonal domain. It has two holes. Two points, P and Q, see each other if the line segment between them is in the region. And we, it, it, it's a coverage problem. You're trying to place the fewest cameras or the fewest guards in a domain in order to see, to cover all of the region. And we look at both static guards and mobile guards. The Watchman route is an example of the mobile guard problem. Um, here's the min coverage problem. This one point sees that region. Add these other points. These five guards see everything. So the guard number, what I call G of P, is at most five because I produced five. But actually computing the fewest guards to cover a geometric domain, even if the domain is a simple polygon without holes, turns out to be NP hard. And so again, my pursuit is generally to try to compute it approximately. 
and look at other variations where we can get very good approximations. So the art gallery theorem says that no matter what, if you're looking at a simple polygon with n vertices, you'll never need more than floor of n over 3 guards. This is a classic answer to a question of Victor Klee. And there's an induction proof by Vashik Fatal. There's a real simple one-liner based on a coloring argument by Fisk uh, of this fact. This is a combinatorial fact that the guarding number need not be more than n over 3 floor. But that doesn't tell you what the optimum is for a particular polygon. If you look at a particular polygon, one thing that we're interested in is computing a good lower bound. If I produce these four dots, and in yellow I've shown their visibility regions, what they see, the fact that these four visibility regions are pairwise disjoint tells me each region must have its own guard. No two of these purple dots can be seen by the same guard. So the presence of those four points proves that this, the guarding number of this polygon is at least four. This gives us a good lower bound. In this case, it's a very good lower bound because, in fact, four guards are enough. So one of the questions is find the maximum number of visibly independent witness points, as I call them, in this polygon. So there's four guards that work. You have a lower bound. You have an upper bound. They match. It's, the guard number is four. So I call this the witness number. This, it's a packing problem. So you're trying to pack the maximum number of disjoint visibility regions within a domain. And recently, we convinced ourselves we can compute this exactly in polynomial time via dynamic programming algorithm. Um, and for a while, I've noticed that a lot of the polygons, particularly the ones I give to my students when we talk about this in my course, um, have the property that g equals w. The guard number equals the witness number. So one's an upper bound, one's a lower bound. If they happen to match, then I call these perfect polygons. It sort of reminds me of the notion of a perfect graph. So a polygon is perfect if the guard number and witness number match. Are there polygons that are not perfect? Well, there certainly are. Some of you can probably spot one right away. Uh, a pioneer in our field is Godfrey Toussaint. And Godfrey's favorite polygon is this hexagon. And it's a counterexample to many, many things. It's also the smallest instance of a non-perfect polygon. It has witness number one, guard number two. OK? So there's one witness. There's two guards. You can easily argue that there's a gap between the lower and upper bound. Um, so a question I'll pose to you for homework. Uh, which simple polygons are perfect? Can you characterize them? I don't know. Uh, is there an algorithm to detect if a polygon is perfect or not? Just because finding the guard number is known to be NP-hard doesn't imply that deciding if the guard number equals the witness number is hard. Finding the witness number we can do in polynomial time. Finding the guard number we know is NP-hard. Deciding whether or not a polygon is perfect, we don't know yet. Um, now, a recent result, uh, joint work with Eric Domain and others uh, from last fall, is that uh, if the polygon has holes, we can prove that detecting perfection is hard. Um, and there are polygons like this. This is what I call a spike box. Uh, this has witness number one or two, but it can have a large uh, you, you can make it so this has a linear number of guards necessary, yet it might have witness number one. So there can be a large gap. Here's just a snapshot of our construction from this, this work uh, on proving that detecting perfection. This is a polygon with holes. The polygon is the union of the black segments. In fact, the segments are horizontal, vertical, or at 45 degrees, three orientations. And even such polygons or such domains it turns out that detecting perfection is hard. Um, what about algorithms to place an optimal set of guards? We're trying to place as few guards as possible. I said it's NP-hard. So what do we do when we face NP-hard problems? Well, we might be able to say something experimentally and get practical solutions. And uh, that's been done to some extent. And the other is to look for approximation algorithms. And again, there's some progress in that direction. 
So experimentally, we did some of the early work where we implemented 14 different heuristics for placing guards. We also implemented three heuristics for placing witness points to get a lower bound. This was before we knew that there was an exact polynomial algorithm. And we ran lots of experiments. In fact, on randomly generated polygons, it, it never was worse than a factor two, the ratio of guard number to witness number. So, so these, these, the heuristics were performing well, plus this is some experimental evidence that in some sense most polygons are almost perfect. The ratio is bounded. We believe there's a large family of polygons that are perfect or nearly perfect. Um, and there's been a lot of sophisticated methods based on linear programming, integer programming techniques by Shandor Fekete and, and his uh, Brazilian uh, colleagues on exactly this, this problem as well where they can get provably optimal. Now we get provably optimal when our upper bounds and lower bounds match in, in our experiments with these heuristics. And of course our heuristics are, are fast. They're, they're polynomial time, fast heuristics. They give upper and lower bounds. Here's spike box, et cetera. Red dots are guards, green dots are witness points. And we compute both of them and we ran on several instances, including polygons with holes. Uh, there's the Kvatal comb example. And the Gottfried example, again, all of these solved to optimality. Approximation algorithms, there's a long pursuit here. The most recent uh, paper appeared on archive a few months back. It claims a constant factor approximation for vertex guards, uh, Subir Ghosh and colleagues. Um, and uh, there's a, a paper that appeared in Sausage last year that gives a log of opt, g star is the optimal guard number here, log factor approximation. It makes some assumptions, it's not fully general log approximation, but they also uh, show that uh, you sometimes need irrationally uh, placed guards at, at irrational coordinates even if the vertices of the polygon are rational or, or integer. So special cases have some solutions, some even have very good solutions. I want to mention some variations where we're able to say even more. So some variations um, in K-guarding um, where you're, you're uh, trying to get, uh, uh, I, I guess that's where they are able to see through K walls, if I recall correctly, I'm not sure. Alpha guards, triangle guards, we've worked on the alpha guards, triangle guards, epsilon R guards, I'll mention what that is and universal guards. So alpha guards, I want every point in my region, I'm to guard this blue region, the black dots are the guards, and a point is well guarded if you see him from two directions that are sufficiently distinct, at least angle alpha. So if I can see you and this guard can also see you, well we aren't really seeing you from different perspectives. So the goal of this model is to say, I want to insist that every point that I'm trying to guard, I will see it from significantly different perspectives. For instance, for security applications where you want to get a good face shot of an intruder or something, uh, we're, we're interested in this. And for this, we give provable approximations for finding such alpha guards. Uh, also in joint work with Alone Frat and Sariel Harpelid, we looked at triangle guarding where now it's not just based on an angle alpha, but I'm going to insist that every point in the region to be guarded lies inside of a triangle. Now the triangle doesn't have to be inside the polygon, but the point P has to lie inside a triangle of guards. So in, in essence, you see him from all directions. So this is what we call triangle guarding, and again, we're able to give uh, good approximations. In this case, it's a log factor approximation for triangle guarding. And then a more recent uh, method uh, or model that I talk about is epsilon r robust guards. And this is using the observation that when you place a guard at a particular point, there's actually some uncertainty about exactly where you're placing it. You can't place it so precisely. You know, these bad examples have these spikes and they require a guard to be very, very precisely placed. What if every time you place a guard, there's a little bit of noise? And I want an optimal guard set that takes into account noisy placement. Or when you station a guard, he's not going to stand perfectly still. He's going to move around a little bit, right? So suppose there's a radius epsilon 
ball. And so when you place a guard in this ball, you, you can't necessarily see every point that's in a narrow spike. In particular, I'm going to say that you can see a point Q if and only if any placement of the guard within his noise disk allows you to see Q. So this ice cream cone has to lie inside the polygon. And what that means is it doesn't let you see all the way to the end of very skinny spikes. So this is buying us some fatness. And fatness helps us in computational geometry. So the region that's covered by this guard, which is really a noisy guard, is this purple region. And this gives us the power to give a much better approximation. When coupled with, I said there's a second parameter, there's capital R. So I call these realistic guards. You can't place the guard better than, a, than epsilon precision, and guards can't not see to infinity. They can only see to some distance capital R. In that case, as long as you have a bounded ratio of R over epsilon, we're able to give a PTAS. So minimize the number of guards in a domain where they have to be epsilon R robust. Okay. So sometimes strengthening the model makes the results easier to obtain. And it's again based on M guillotine methods. I'm not going to go through everything here. I mean, what we're doing is a form of dominating set. If you, if you view the problem appropriately, it's a minimum dominating set instance uh, that comes from geometry that we're able to argue has a PTAS. Universal guards. Let me mention this, and then I'll wrap things up. Universal guards, Victor Klee asked, given an n-gon, how many guards are always sufficient and sometimes necessary to guard an n-gon? I ask, how many guards are always sufficient and sometimes necessary to guard any n-gon that you get from a set of n points? So I'm not going to give you the n-gon, I'm going to give you the points. And I want it to be these to be universal guards. They will work no matter which polygonalization of the endpoints you have. Maybe there's uncertainty on that. And this is what I call the universal guards problem. Uh, here's a set of points. Place guards at the red dots. They will guard this polygonalization. They will guard this polygonalization. They'll guard that polygonalization. They'll guard that polygonalization. Um, this one, they don't. So that pair was not universal. Turns out, if you add to it this one other point, it is universal. Now, I don't actually know how to compute universal guards. There's many open questions here. We started to look at the combinatorial result. Um, how large a, a, a set do you need? And it, it turns out that you essentially need uh, there, I, I won't show you the examples, but examples exist that require you to essentially put guards at every point in the worst case. But in most cases, that's not the case. So the interesting open questions here, we don't know the hardness of computing universal guards. We don't know how to approximate. We don't know anything about uh, the computational problem of computing universal guards for a point set. And there's many practical motivations for universal guards or nearly universal guards, but we, we, we don't know how to address those yet. And just to conclude, related to, to universal guards, I'll mention the guarding game. This is a, a game that I like to encourage you to play on napkins or when you're bored. Uh, two players, you've got Alice, the polygonalizer, and Bob, the guarder. And you draw a bunch of dots, so you have a set of points. Uh, and you can play this either in multiple rounds or in a single round. In the single round, what's going to happen is Alice is going to secretly draw a polygon on the points. And Bob will secretly pick a subset of the points, depending on what this function is. And part of the question is, what should this function be in order for the game to be fair? And that's, that's one of the open questions. But you can play it with various numbers here. Uh, one obvious choice might be n over 3, since the art gallery theorem says n over 3 always works. Now, it, if you saw the n-gon, then you know n over 3 guards will always work for that n-gon. But you don't know the n-gon if you're Bob. You're placing guards hoping that Alice's polygon will be seen by your guards. Th then you win. If not, she wins. Okay. So 
We don't know what the right answer is. Here, here's the point set. Alice goes and uh, polygonalizes it like that. Bob goes and picks these three. Let's say his budget was three in this case. You put them together and Bob just lost because these guys don't guard the entire polygon. They don't see this region up here. So there's a lot about this cute game that we just don't know, like what the parameters should be, uh, how to go about playing it. And one of the questions is, you know, how, can you even optimize Alice's strategy? What's, what's her strategy? How, how do you polygonalize a set of points that makes it the most difficult for, uh, 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 for guarding? Like maximize the guard number for a given set of points. Alice wins in this case. Um, and the, these are some of the questions. Uh, there's also, like I said, the alternating play version where you place a guard, she places some number of edges. You get to see the edges. Then you place another guard, she's seeing where the guards are, and she places edges, etc. Try that one as well. That one's really tricky to play. And a student in one of my classes has recently uh, developed a little computer program. I'm hoping to turn it into an app that lets people play this garden game. It came from a practical problem that Alone Frat and others uh, with me, we were looking at protective jamming for security applications. You have a data center uh, facility and there's a fence around the outside, but you're worried about intruders that will come and listen from the outside, these eavesdroppers. And you want to place protective jammers, so jam signals. And the tricky thing here is you want to jam the eavesdroppers so they can't hear anything that's going on inside electronically, but you don't want to jam yourself. And for this, again, we have approximation algorithms. So I, I think this is a good time to pause. The next subject would be back to Watchman root problems, but let me stop here and ask if there's any questions. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I have one question. You were yep. talking mostly in the plane for a traveling salesman, but if you have drones delivering maybe to balconies or something, you would have something that's not quite the plane, but sure. it's not fully 3D. Do any of your yeah, so two and a half D. Well, so first of all, for 3D, the uh, approximation methods for TSP apply. Uh, what, what doesn't necessarily, well, what is it that doesn't necessarily apply? Well, even TSP with neighborhoods, we know how to do in, in spaces of bounded doubling dimension. Um, all of those, uh, caveat, all of those results are, are truly sort of theoretical. I won't claim that they're practical. What we're trying to do, for instance, with the drone delivery problem, this horse fly problem, is we are we are trying to, to give practical methods. So I have also a student who implemented some heuristics, some greedy heuristics um, that uh, appear to work very well in, in, in practice. What we don't have yet for the uh, horsefly problem, for the drone delivery problem, is any kind of provable results. We think we're very close to that, though. Um, but you're right. Drones are going to perhaps go up to higher elevation floors in your, in your cities and deliver packages. Of course, my fear with drones is if there's a failure, you've got you know, hard, sharp objects dropping down on people's heads, right? So it's not clear what the model of you know, uh, control and safety would be if and when we go to drone delivery uh, and exactly how helpful that is. You're also very limited in how heavy a package you can carry with these drones. What we're really trying to do is control swarms of robots. Some of the stuff I didn't have time to get to had to do with swarm robotics where we have um, constraints on the cloud of robots that are trying to perform a task like guarding, visibility sweeping, mapping a city. We're looking at ways to, to compute these visibility routes in order to get accurate maps of a three-dimensional city. Um, how you can do all of those things practically uh, that, that's, that's of great importance. Yeah? In, in the horsefly examples you gave, it seemed just from the pictures that in, in one of the pictures, the, the drone had to go from the depot, drop off one thing, and come back to the depot. It couldn't go. To that, that was the extreme. So in the extreme where 
uh, so we were looking at two extremes. One is where the truck is much faster than the drone, then the truck might as well just do the delivery and be a TSP. The other in which the truck is super slow and the drones are much, much faster, in which case the truck is effectively just at a point. It's the depot. And, and the drones will go deliver their packages and come back. But is there a limit that the drone can only carry one thing? Ah, great question. So uh, the, the realistic version of these problems, yes, you have a capacity limit on the drone, how, many, how much weight, how many packages he can carry. And what I was showing you there was just the case that the drone was doing, delivering one package at a time and coming back. So the second picture looked like occasionally it was going to multiple I think that was just an optical illusion because in the second picture what was happening is there were multiple drones. So that had three drones. Okay. Uh, so there is the requirement that the drone come back to the mothership uh, to get a package, but also there's the other issue, and that is recharging if they're electric or refueling and considering those times. And I didn't say it, but the objective function in that, in the horsefly problem is to minimize the make span, minimize the time until all the packages are delivered. So you do care about all of these recharging things that are going along the way. Okay. Other questions? questions? Solutions? Thank you for your attention. Thank you.